A couple of days later in the early morning at the warehouse. Dawn passed hours ago, but the early morning continues to linger in the still air. I stand at the door which leads back into the kitchen, allowing the fresh air to fill the room, the warmth seeping over me. With my tea clasped firmly in my hand, I close my eyes and breathe in the start of the day. But the peaceful quiet allows my brain to swirl and focus on everything I've been trying to suppress. The trappers, the Anunnaki, Verdus distrust, my girlfriend who also happens to be a vampire. That last one causes the torrent of uncertainty to quiet. Thoughts of Farah grow until she's the only thing I can focus on, and even though we haven't moved forwards with our feelings, a happiness still makes me feel as light as the breeze that blows past me. But I have to focus. I remind myself with a shake of the head. The blood drive is going to be an interesting event to get through, and if I don't concentrate, then we may never pull it off. The inner door to the kitchen creaks open, and I spin on the spot as Farah bounces inside with a cheery grin, which only brightens further on seeing me. You're up already? She asks, making a beeline to my position so that she can press a gentle kiss on my cheek, her arms wrapping around my middle. We didn't wake you, did we? No, I was up a while ago, I reply, further comforted by her presence, all previous concerns draining away. The others eventually trail inside, looking annoyingly as fresh and energised as if they hadn't already been out on a three-hour patrol that morning. Vampires. I stifle a chuckle at the thought. Are you prepared for the mission ahead? Ava asks. It's hardly a mission, I say with a small shrug. The blood drive is an annual event, and you'll be the newcomers there, not me. I'm well practised at it. And I hope that practice extends to avoiding getting your blood drawn, Ava report retorts. If someone gets a hold of your blood... Morgan groans and rolls her eyes. Yeah, we're all well aware of what could happen by this point. I'm sure we can manage it. It's not like we're going up against supernaturals, I say in order to counter Ava's intensity over the small events. Maybe we are, for our comments before shrugging. That Captain Sang seems like a good candidate for a supernatural. <laughs> Hmm. The idea prompts my brow to arch up and forward. Would you be able to tell if he was? Not necessarily, Nat replies. Some supernaturals are talented at hiding themselves, even from those who are highly adapted to recognizing other supernaturals. I suppose that makes sense, I say with a nod. Ava gestures at the two other vampires. Brian and Morgan are best suited to finding supernaturals amongst humans when needed. Not, what, not that we like to brag about it or anything. Farah gives a shrug before a wide smile find its way into her, finds its way onto her lips. Are you going to work out a plan or what? Morgan asks, bringing us back from our tangent. Morgan's got a point. What is actually happening today? Nat asks. I'm well aware it's a blood drive, but how does this blood drive usually take place? They glance to me. Well, the yes, Captain Sung has been in charge of the event. It's been a very samey, static kind of thing, I say, frowning slightly as I try to think back on those boringly long days. And he always keeps the same setup every year. That's good. Knowing the terrain can be of benefit to us. Ava gestures at the kitchen table. Will you show us? Sure, I say, glancing about and wondering how best to demonstrate. Uh, yeah, we're grabbing paper. <laughs> Walking towards the table, I place my cup down and purse my lips. Do you have any paper to hand? Ava nods, tilting her head towards the vintage antique dresser, complete with a spread of plates on display. Plates I imagine are worth more than most of my belongings, as seems to be the theme of the warehouse's decor. I pull out a drawer and retrieve some of the graph paper, grabbing a pen at the same time. Spreading out a few sheets in an almost perfect rectangle to cover the table, I begin sketching out the layout of the library, where the captain always holds the event doing my best to ensure it's as close to scale as I can make it. Well, that's... Farah begins clearing... Her, uh, yeah, begins before clearing her throat. Organized? I'm not sure it's the word she'd intended to use. It's wonderful, Ava exhales. I'm not sure I've ever heard her quite so breathy. I'm glad you understand the importance of this, Detective. I couldn't have asked for a better tactical map to plan our next move. Farah glances to her. Careful, Ava, you'll get drool on it. Nat barely conceals a chuckle at the comment, to which Ava sighs and looks around to Morgan. Please say you agree with me on this, Ava pleads with a spread of her arms. Morgan shrugs. I wasn't even paying attention. Ava lets out a long groan. It should help give you the basic idea, I say, hunching over my map like a general over a battle plan. 
It'll take place in a library, a pretty small space. Any people that do turn up to donate will be funneled through here. I sweep a finger between the queue lines I drew down the center. And it'll be very obvious if I'm not part of those few. So we need to think of a way to either keep you out of sight or preclude you from giving blood altogether, Eva states. Rob moves back to rejoin me, slipping her hand over mine on the table. My body instantly reacts to the touch by sending a buzz of tingles, spraying from my fingertips all the way down to my toes. Why don't you just stay here with me? She smiles so temptingly that I almost don't process her words. That sounds like a much better plan. I open my mouth to wholeheartedly agree when Morgan steps forward to point out where I've indicated the captain usually sits. I think you'll notice if his one detective isn't there. She states with a shrug before drawing her hand back. Fra sighs, obviously not having had much hope in her plan to start with. Well, that sucks. It really does. I mumble in agreement. I are going to need help, Ava continues, as though the interruption hadn't even happened. Her eyes focused on the map. Just one other person should be enough. We don't need too many strangers bringing attention to themselves. Who are you thinking of? I ask, half curious if it'll be someone I've met. A small wave of relief washes over me when she does say a name I know. A letter may be of best use here. His medical training could easily apply to be one of the volunteers taking blood, Ava explains. Nat glances up from the map to the team leader. What if they already have enough volunteers? The agency will make sure they have room for one more, she replies with such confidence that I have no doubt about it. Okay, I say. We have a contingency plan, but mostly I'll just do my best to stay out of the captain's sight. He may forget my obligation if he's too focused on organizing the volunteers. I give a nod and step back from the table. We'll be there too, Ned says, glancing over to Ava for a confirming nod, which she receives. But we'll stick to the sidelines. As Ava said, too many strangers will attract attention. You're not complete strangers to the town by now, I reply. We've seen you around. Nat smiles. But we're still the newest residents, and that can draw attention. That's something I can't disagree with. There's nothing this town loves more than the new and shiny to awe and gossip over. And we have a plan, Farrar says. That we do, Ava nods towards me. You go ahead and we'll follow behind. Turning to Farah, I squeeze her hand and peck a kiss on her cheek. See you later. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not choosing a pet name. I reluctantly draw away from her after the goodbye and head out of the room. The previous plan overtaken by thoughts focused on Farah. Mid-morning at Wayhaven Public Library. I swing my head from side to side, though it's hardly necessary to look so widely when there's only three people currently in the library. One of them isn't even here to donate blood. The plan was to stay out of sight, but unless I can fold myself into one of the bookshelves, then it seemed an ever-growing impossible task. Luckily, Captain Sung has been mostly hanging around outside, trying to draw people in with the temptation of coffee and cake, all kindly provided by Haley's Bakery. It's a sugary seduction that people are having difficulty passing up, and I can understand why. A few more volunteers step through the library, the heavy library doors, letting in a glimpse of the sunshine outside. The library is one of the oldest buildings in Wayhaven, and one of the few not converted from a warehouse, but instead, instead built for its purpose. It's a hexagonal-shaped building on the inside, with an old weathered wraparound counter at the front, denoting one side as the entrance and the other as the exit. It's made of the same heavy wood that panels the walls. Only two walls have windows, but they face each other to allow a splash of light, to add some warmth to the cream-painted walls covered in creating bookshelves. The rest of the space is sectioned into small rooms by freestanding bookshelves, an area for children's books with an attempt at a play area, a section for crime fiction, another for romance, another for fantasy, and so on. In the very centre is a couple of desks set up with computers. It's not the most modern space, but it's a vital organ within the body of the community. Another small bustle of people trudge through the doorway, eyes already scanning for the baked goods table that tempts them closer to the small tent set up at the back where blood is being taken. I'm distracted from the scene as a hand rests on my arm. I glance down at the hand, then at the arm, and finally all the way up to see a familiar and very welcome smile. How's it going, babe? Fra asks before scanning the practically empty space. Jeez, it's dead in here. Are you sure you got the right day? Yes, definitely today. I pinch at my lower lip and shrug. I guess news about it didn't really get out to enough people. 
for our snorts. Seriously, after all those flyers we sent out, you know people just didn't bother turning up. The lack of expected crowd doesn't mean hiding you will prove... Ava sucks in a breath that fills her chest. Difficult? I finish. She lets out the breath with a groan. Very. I shake my head. I don't think so. Maybe I can't hide in the crowd, but Sung seems pretty intent on staying outside to convince as many people as he can to donate. As long as nothing happens to draw him inside, then I doubt he'll notice whatever I'm doing. All right, Ava says with a nod. My gaze is drawn to the heads turning in our direction. Unit Bravo, especially in a space like this, are certainly causing a stir. I notice quite a few peeks over the top of people's books, as well as all-out gawping from one library patron. Fortunately, you guys aren't helping me keep a low profile in here. I turn to start herding them towards the exit. I can handle this. We hadn't planned to stay, Ava states. Farah springs towards the exit. Thankfully, this place doesn't exactly scream fun. But we did want to make sure you got here and were settled, Nat says with a warm smile in my direction. The team leader's gaze turns to me. As well as let you know the contingency plan is in, peace, is in place, we have a member of the agency waiting in the donation tent should your plan not succeed. You think it won't? I ask with an arch of my brow. A small flicker of appreciation at my questioning catches her expression. Not at all. In fact, I doubt we will be needed at all today. Farah lifts a brow. That's seriously not what I expected you to say right then. I give an appreciative nod at the team leader. Come on. Morgan groans, already turning towards the exit and away from the prying stairs. Let's get going already. Farah glances around the library a final time before giving me a squeeze around the middle and pecking a kiss on my cheek. Try not to get too bored, she whispers against my ear, sending a shiver through me that will make focusing a whole lot more difficult. And with that, the group stride from the library with everyone's gazes following them closely as they go. The air is still and silent, allowing a distinct and strange kind of vulnerability I feel without Unit Bravo nearby to sink into me. I let out a scoffed laugh, wondering if I've come to rely on them so much already, or maybe it's just a familiarity that brings me such confidence. Whatever the reason, it's certainly something I've become conscious was absent in my life until this moment. I shake my head to rid it of the rather heavy thought and focus myself on the task ahead. Through the floor-to-ceiling window, I can make out the back of Captain Sung. He's still rigidly standing in place, accosting anyone who crosses his path about the blood drive. He seems set out there for the day, so all I need to do is keep a low profile, even with the boredom. Maybe I could do something quiet to pass the time. Hmm. Sure, we'll look for Tina. I sit down in one of the armchairs of the small reading area nearby, tapping my fingers against the arm of it. I blow out a breath, my toes tap against the floor. I skim a book and snap it shut after it fails to catch my attention. Eventually, my noisy movements draw the attention of the librarian, who taps her pen against the desk and points it at me with a warning glower. I shy away from her surprisingly strict hiss. Someone got told off? A voice taunts in a mocking sing-song behind me. You do know we're not in the school anymore, I ask, glancing over my shoulder to Tina, who settles into the chair opposite. And yet I still have to wear a uniform, she moans, picking at the thick blue material of her outfit. This must be an easy shift for you, I say, nodding my head towards where one lone donor is leaving the tent. She slouches into the seat so that she can rest her head on the back cushion, her hair tucked into a messy braid which flops against her shoulder. Boring, more like, though at least the mayor didn't decide to make an appearance. Are you here to donate? Hmm. I shake my head, pushing back into my seat as though the padding might be able to suck me in further. I'm staying as far away from needles as I possibly can. Then maybe outside would be better than right next to the tent, she suggests with a light laugh. Well, that would be preferable, I admit with a shrug. But Sung is outside, and if he sees me, then there's no way I'm staying out of there. I stretch a finger towards the foreboding pale blue donation tent where the entrance flaps even without a breeze. We both choke away from it with fearful grimaces. I forgot you were required to donate now that you're a detective, she says before standing and walking to me, slapping a hand onto my shoulder. Don't worry, I've got your back. A uh, promise that is very much about to be tested. You can't take another book out, Edna? The librarian states with a solid shake of her head. But why not? 
the old woman demands, her wrinkled fist shaking at the younger woman standing safely behind the barrier of the wooden desk. I have every right. I glance at Tina, who glances at me, and we both spring out of our seats and head towards the building commotion, stepping in sync exactly as we used to when we were partners. Something wrong? Tina asks, pushing a smile into her face as we near the pair. Edna turns to her, glancing at the badge on her belt. She swings back around to jab an accusing finger at the librarian. She's saying I can't loan any more books. The librarian's head tips back as she sighs and rubs at her neck. No, I said you can't take any more out until you return the hundred you already have out on loan. She stares the old woman down. And pay your late fees. Edna gasps, a thin hand spreading across her chest. When Gert ran this place, Gert retired. You get me now, the librarian states. The tirade that begins between them fills the library with its high-pitched, angered cacophony. An explosion of sound that is bound to attract Sung's attention if I don't get it under control. Tina looks to me with a what-do-you-want-to-do shrug. Hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. We will take that one. Okay, calm down, both of you. I call, waving my hands to end their shouting. It works, although they both seethe at each other over the desk. I step between them and turn to Edna. I can take out any books I want, Edna argues as she looks to me. So can everyone else, I begin, spreading an arm around the library. The few patrons trying to make it less obvious that they were staring at the scene. If you keep hold of those books, then you're denying everyone else the chance to read them. I've had five people ask for one of the books you're hoarding. Five, the librarian adds, holding up five fingers for emphasis. Tina signals for the woman to be quiet, which she thankfully does, so I turn back to Edna. Well, if they're that interested, they can come get them themselves, Edna replies, her lower jaw jutting out with a defiant thrust. Seriously? The librarian clicks her tongue and rolls her eyes. All people think they can get away with anything. Old? Edna snaps. The librarian tilts her head. You're right, I meant ancient. Edna gasps, tilting back for a moment, and I worry that if any of us even breathe, she might completely topple backwards. I take the momentary pause to glance out through the glass panels of the doors, where I can see Sung starting to peer inside to find the source of the racket. But my momentary distraction means I forget to keep watch over Edna, who is now trying to clamber over the desk, her cane slapping against the wood top in some kind of challenge. That's enough from you, girl, Edna yells. Bring it on, creature of the crypt, the librarian wields her scanner in one hand and scowls with her best battle face. What the hell is happening right now? Tina yells as her eyes widen, stepping up to wrestle the old woman back from the desk. She struggles to contain the flailing of Edna's frail limbs. A flash of a thought keeps me from moving for a moment. How am I going to write this up on a report? But the sharp snap of a voice makes us all flinch. That's enough. Our heads all swivel towards the doors, where Captain Sung is certainly living up to his imposing position as he storms towards us with bold fists, clutching his lapels. What is going on here? He snaps his gaze to me. And why are you just standing there letting off his opponent break this up? I glance at Tina, who is now supporting the sunken weight of Edna in her arms, as the old woman tries to find her balance. Oh, it's fine. I'm all good. Tina comments, barely biting back the laugh I can see twinkling in her eyes. Sung purses his lips before rolling them together. Well, if you're certain you have the situation under control. Tina glances between Edna and the librarian, who are both hanging their heads down, their gazes avoiding Sung's at all costs. Then Detective Langford, I believe there is a responsibility you need to be taking on yourself. His arm cuts a path towards the donation tent. I groan. At the edge of the trees and hidden in the shadows. There's something about the humans. Sin's not sure whether to pity them for their fragile, unsuspecting nature or envy them. Through the gloom of the trees, his gaze pierces through the window of the book-laden building. Sin cares only for one of them. He spies them with another human who is leading them to a blue tent nestled among the bookshelves. The person does not, does not look pleased to be led by the other human. Sin had wondered about using the distraction to sweep in and steal the human that is so sought after, but instead, he watched. Watched how they interacted, watched how people looked to them, watched how they were so free amongst them all. Watched how they was so free amongst... that's not proper English. 
Watched away that, as Sin is also doing, a vampire keeps a careful eye over the human from a distance. His leash holder has destroyed so many lives, and Sin is well aware that he has been the instrument she has used to do so. But this one human fought back, and succeeded. Maybe. He stops the fault with a grit of his teeth before the hope it might bring takes hold too deeply. In a rush of wind, he takes off into the sky, the humans below not looking up once from their interest in their own lives to notice him. After depositing me directly in front of the donation tent, Captain Sung marches back out of the library and I'm left to my fate. Are you ready? A volunteer asks, not waiting for a response before shoving a clipboard and pen towards me. Here, if you'll sign this, these, we can get going. I do as asked. He snatches back the clipboard and opens the tent flap, ushering me inside as though I might make a break for escape, which had crossed my mind. Inside, the tent is empty, except for the nurses who instantly perk up on their stools to look at me with hope. I can't imagine how bored they must have been all day. I'm about to follow again when a waved hand catches my notice at the end of the tent. As I lock eyes with her unusually large ones, I don't get a sense of recognition at all that might have inspired her to be waving at me. That's when she lifts the bottom part of her top to reveal an agency shield embroidered on the vest beneath. I quickly straighten myself and look to the volunteer. Uh, actually, I say catching the volunteer's attention, I think I'd be more comfortable down that end with her. He angles himself around me to look down the tent. With Dr. Tuft? Yes, exactly. He glances down at the chart on his electronic tablet and chews at his lip. But that would put the schedule off plan. Panic wants to grip at my chest, but I ease it away trying to think of a solution. Unless I get in Tuft's chair, then today will have been even more of a failure than it already is. Hmm. Yeah, we'll give good reasoning. I swing my focus between the tent flap and the nearby chair that he once more indicates is the one I should be taking. But this one is right by the exit, I state. He sighs. Your point? Well, surely there are people who need those more than I do. I nudge my head to gesture down the tent. Whereas that one is much more difficult to get to. We hardly have enough donors to be worrying about that. So far, I interrupt, holding up a finger. Who knows how many might arrive in the next few minutes? He makes a popping noise with his lips as he thinks before giving a stiff nod. All right, head down there and I'll make, mark the change. Will do, thank you, I say, but he's already too busy changing things on his tablet to notice me leave. Reaching the end of the corridor, I head inside the fabric cubicle and yank shut the partition. It feels strangely private considering it's only cloth separating us from the rest of the tent. The short woman I saw earlier stares up at me from the stool she's sitting on. There's no need to worry, Detective Langford. My name is Dr. Tuft. I was sent by the agency to help you here if needed today. I thought Elidor was supposed to be the backup today. I comment, glancing about as though his large frame might be hidden behind a selection of wired monitors or makeshift cupboards. She swivels on the stool and begins to fiddle with a packet. He was supposed to be, but he... A voice stumbles. He's not been on duty for a few days. Please take a seat. I frown while Elidor is asked, shifting onto the padded medical chair. Is he all right? I'm afraid I don't know about Nurse Cobra's whereabouts or dealings. A slight tweak of worry makes her features wrinkle for a moment. I nod, unsure whether to ask any more, but not exactly comforted by her reply. So, what are you going to do here? Are you really going to take blood? I ask. She shakes her head, a small hint of silver glimmering, silver glimmer glittering across her cheeks before it fades again. Definitely not. We can't risk your blood getting anywhere near humans. She arches a brow while side-eyeing me. No offense, I meant humans who are not aware of our world. She takes a vial and places her hand over it. My mouth almost falls open as I watch blood beginning to fill the plastic container. I have no idea where from, it just appears. At the same time, sweat beads across my skin, the temperature already stifling from the summer's heat, picking up quite a few degrees around us. I tug at my t-shirt, blowing a breath out. It does nothing to help with the feeling of my skin gradually cooking in a small space. Just as I'm about to give in and stumble out of the cubicle for cool air, the vial is filled and the temperature instantly drops. I fall back against the seat and fan myself with one hand. Sorry for the discomfort, detective. Magic like this requires energy, she explains, leaning forward onto the desk for one wobbly moment. After a quick shake of her head, she sits back up, but her eyes are heavy and sunken against her slightly grayed skin. She places the tube down and begins to write out a label for it. A glance between the now filled vial and her. Did you just create blood? She pauses for a moment to draw in another steadying breath. 
in a sense, it's a little more complicated than that. Hmm. <laughs> sure. Interest has me perking up on the chair. I enjoy complicated. She examines me with a close eye before tilting her head slightly and smiling. You're being genuine, aren't you? Why wouldn't I be? I know you can all do you can do all these amazing things that must seem so normal to you, but to me, there's something from a storybook. It's incredible to see it in real life. A slight flush of a of glittering pink blossoms across her nose, so she turns away and clears her throat, focusing back on labeling the vial. Then you will be well suited for a life at the agency. You really think so? Oh, I know so. Inquisitive minds always make their way up the ranks the fastest. She chuckles before glancing over her shoulder to me. You can go now. We're done here. I ease myself out of my seat, giving a small wave before ducking through the partition's flimsy material. I skirt past a volunteer from earlier, head through the tent's exit and into the library, and then exit out the front doors and into the freedom the outside air provides. Outside, it seems Sung packed up a while ago and left. It's not much of a surprise, considering the poor turnout. I'm just stretching my limbs out as I walk along the path when a voice echoes nearby. There you are. I flinch at the shout, which is accompanied by a familiar figure darting towards me across the sunlit parking lot. Nat slows from her rushed pace, then draws to a stop. What's wrong? I ask, my stomach lurching to think of what else might have happened today. The agency is called. Nat's long features look drawn as she stares at me through heavy eyes. It's not good. I nod instantly taking off after Nat towards the rest of Unit Bravo. Next chapter. <laughs>